morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ford Asia CEO Online Forum brought to you by Asia CEO in partnership with PLDT Enterprise, Multisys, Regis, LBC, and JLL. Before we begin, please bow down your heads and join us for the invocation. Heavenly Father, we come to you in confidence asking for your blessings and graces as we hold today's event. We thank you for your guidance, protection, and love. We wish to thank our partners, friends, viewers who are with us today. None of this will be possible without everyone's help and contribution. We are grateful for this opportunity to be with the great speakers. Please bless our speakers, speak to our hearts, through their words. Dear God, you have clearly showed us how to conduct our event with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm. We are grateful for the opportunity to come together in unity, service, and love. Bless us that we may be one in heart and in mind for one purpose, to help Filipinos. Guide our hearts and minds in the spirit of fairness, right thought, and speech. Impart your supreme wisdom upon our activities so that our affairs may reach a successful conclusion. Grant us peace in knowing we are pursuing your purpose for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the Philippine National Anthem. COVID-19 has shown us that we can work well anywhere, anytime, and on any device. Technology lets us get more done, gives us more flexibility, and saves everyone money. Welcome to the Fort Asia CEO Online Forum. Okay, good morning everyone. So glad to have everyone here. I know we had well over a thousand people registered for the event, so the, given our experience in the past, we'll have quite a few thousands of people with us from around the world. Really glad to have you. So technology, this is the thing that has saved us over the past few months, it seems to me. Both our workplace has been saved uh, mainly and our mental state because we have something to do with our time but we want to promote the use of technology for the future i can say that we're all sick and tired of hearing about filipinos as most filipinos do spend three to four hours per day in transit and with technology they can be freed a little bit by this even if they can work uh, a day or two a week with technology from home or other places. Women with children in particular can be empowered. This is a heartbreaking thing and most business leaders talk about the crisis of losing 
so many good employees because they get pregnant. Also, people in the provinces can finally fully participate uh, in, in the workplace. So we want all of our speakers today to really promote, really commit to promote tech in their workplaces. And all of us listening today, this should be kind of our mission uh, today and end as we gradually, slowly turn to normality. Let's see how it's going to happen, but it seems like it's going to be a stop and go sort of a process. So we're going to hear some top leaders today talk about how we're going to do this and how they're doing it in their own organization. So I'll introduce them here quickly for you first. You can see them on the screen. First, we have Nico El Casiba. He's vice president head of the ICT business group at uh, PLTT Enterprise. Glad to have you, Nico, looking very nice, I must say. Um, next, we have Carlo Ople, the founder of Unbox, the, the country's highest visited tech website. Uh, half a million visitors per day or something, kind of a celebrity uh, in, in the tech online industry. So we're really glad to have him. Is he dressed in his uh, standard kind of rebel attire? So glad to have uh, uh, Carlo uh, uh, today. Our next speaker is looking very handsome and dapper is Alex Cabrera. He is the chairman and uh, CEO of P PwC Philippines, the country's second largest and fastest growing audit firm in the country. So glad to have you, Alex, with us today. Next is Patrick Gentry. Patrick is uh, one of the nation's kind of tech Leaders certainly built the country's dominant HR systems platform. So we're pleased to hear about his success. I should tell you that his business was founded by himself and his wife, his Filipino wife. So don't want to forget her. She's been a key part, as I'm sure he'll uh, uh, vouch. Next is David Elmeral. He is one of the country's leading tech entrepreneurs. And uh, I noticed that just like Patrick, his hair has grown a bit over the past few months, but still uh, looking very good. And glad to hear uh, Dave, uh, David is with us, and, and we'll look forward to hearing his as well. Next is Andres Ortola, the general manager of Microsoft with us today, also looking very good, I must say. And lastly, our kind of a highlight is Raymond Laboro, Raymond Laboro with, with us today. I know he's a busy fellow. He's the, the National Privacy Commissioner. We've had him speak live in the past, and he's just the nicest fellow in the world, so we're pleased to have him with us. And so that's our day. We're going to have a very exciting event. So let's get going. And our first speaker we have is Nico El Casiba. He is formal title as VP and head of ICT business for PLDT Enterprise. So he looks after all the kind of up and coming and complicated stuff, data centers, cloud computing, cybersecurity, managed IT services, all these kinds of things. So Nico, look forward to hearing your, uh, your story and uh, welcome to the event. Morning, Richard. Um, on behalf of PLDT Enterprise, a pleasant morning to everyone. I am very excited to be here with you today. Uh, we hope everyone is keeping safe and staying home. Um, Some time back, I read a quote that I'd like to begin with because it resonates today more than ever. We are in the same boat, but we are not. We are not in the same boat, but we are in the same storm. Yes, our circumstances may be different, but we are all dealing with the same uncertain, unsettling, and far-reaching situation. And this is true on both personal and organizational levels. And no true than how we have had to run our businesses and our lives mostly from home. Internet access, online commerce, on-demand contactless delivery, all have become interwoven into our social fabric. From the rise of the now, now iconic ube cheese pandisal to the mundane hair clipper, with the latter becoming essential due to the all-day windfall of, win of video calls in our work-from-home setup. And we have all dealt with this pivot to work from home, from anywhere for that matter, 
with varying degrees of enthusiasm and pessimism. Some were forced into it kicking and screaming. Others embraced it wholeheartedly. And some of us, even today, with more than 70 days of ECQ under our belt, are still on the fence regarding how we feel about our personal lives being a hop, step, and skip away from our workspaces. That being said, the future of work is undeniably steering toward a single yet expansive direction everywhere. In fact, the London Business School in its 2019 Global Leadership Summit projected that half of all jobs will be remote by 2025. Perhaps much sooner now than 2025, given the fluidity of the situation today, and most probably much more than half now with the new physical distancing guidelines. And in order to thrive in this still evolving wave of change in ways of working, we have turned to technology to help us attain a certain sense of control and normalcy in our day-to-day -day tasks. At PLDT Enterprise, our aspiration is to make a positive impact on every single business, enabling them, in turn, to make a positive impact on every single customer. And while quality internet access is the obvious foundation for a productive work from anywhere employee, our own experience tells us that there are other factors that matter. First, data privacy. While each company has its own policies on bring your own device and secure remote access via encrypted connections, other ways to safeguard customer data are through platforms such as virtual desktops where no data leaves the corporate network. This is in wide use globally by healthcare providers, financial institutions, and other organizations that handle sensitive information. On the local policy front, the National Privacy Commission has issued Bulletin 12 on protecting personal data in a work from home arrangement. And our esteemed fellow speaker, Commissioner Liboro, will be covering this in the next few moments. Second, security. Employees are now outside of the company's office network, which opens infinitely more attack vectors for cyber criminals. And cyber, th cyber threats are on an exponential rise. From EPLDT Security Operations Center alone, comparing April 2020 data versus the previous month, we've monitored and mitigated, number one, a doubling in attacks to endpoint devices such as laptops and desktops. Number two, a close to three times increase in cyber attacks to enterprise servers, the very heart of our networks. And number three, the most telling, a nearly 130-fold increase in attempted access to malicious websites, showing that phishing, spearing, whaling are all alive and well. So truly, while the world is in lockdown, cyber criminals are in full force. After all, especially in the chaos today, in every company, there is at least one employee who will click on anything. And third, apart from data privacy and security, is continuity. For us, continuity is about a business being able to run no matter what. And it really means three basic things. Customers, in the case of private organizations, and citizens, in the case of the public sector, are served. Employees can work from anywhere and function productively. Back-end operations are sustained and support business velocity. Although this sounds simple enough, the organizational capability to make it happen is quite complex and requires the interworking of automated processes through, en through enterprise resource planning systems and customer relationship management systems and the like, of protected platforms and data through data center hosting, cybersecurity practices, managed services outsourcing, agile cloud infrastructure, and of empowered and, empl and enabled employees through fixed and wireless broadband, collaboration tools, and a slew of work from anywhere technology, among others. However, there is a caveat to all of this. While technology has the power to accelerate and magnify, it does so to both the good and the bad. 
so shiny hardware and sleek software can be enabling and liberating. Yet, if these are infused into a process that's dysfunctional and or a culture that resists change, even the most sophisticated tech will be rendered ineffective at best and considered debilitating at worst. And so the success of any digital transformation sits squarely within what fuses process, technology, and culture together. And that would be people. Because we can go on and on about technology, data privacy, security, and continuity. But at the heart of things that matter, it's people that truly make it happen. And to end, I would like to share a video that highlights no technology, no solution, no selling, just people who do what needs to be done from behind the scenes and way beyond any mere compliance to duty. Play video, please. Our aim has always been to make a positive impact on every single business. Life as we know it will never be the same again. And times like these remind us of the core of what we do to be at the heart of things that matter. In response to an unprecedented challenge, we invested in the most extraordinary resource of all, our people. As long as our frontliners are out there, our first responders will be in here. While our unsung heroes work to make sure that the society continues to run, our brave employees will make sure that their systems are up and running. In their endeavor to keep the nation safe, we commit to keeping their data and the whole ICT ecosystem secure. Together, we are one with the nation, for the nation. Uh, lately, I know they've got many hundreds of people across the country in kind of work jail uh, scenarios in my uh, way. But, you know, people were sleeping on the floor and, and just to keep our systems going. It hasn't been easy for them. So thanks very much, uh, Nico. Pleased to have you on the event. OK, our next speaker is Carlo Ople. He is uh, editor and founder of Unbox, the country's uh, highest visited tech site. If you, I was looking at it actually this morning, uh, helping you buy tech and, and all that kind of stuff. Also, if you noticed uh, behind him when he comes on the screen, he'll have a whole bunch of shoes. And he is uh, the country's biggest uh, expert and storyteller about shoes. So his YouTube channel has, I think, 600,000 subscribers. So and it's nice to have him. He's kind of a celebrity in the uh, tech and in particular the marketing tech space uh digital marketer of the year award from cmo asia and other things so glad to have carlo please welcome carlo ople to the stage thanks richard uh hey guys happy to be here happy to be with you on this webinar and if there's one thing i want to talk about today is i want to break the misconception that during this particular time in, or season uh, in society in the world that you can just get by, that you can just survive. The reality is there are a lot of opportunities that will allow for you, your businesses, and you as individuals to really thrive. And that's what we'll tackle today. I'll talk about three key opportunities that you need to take a look at as a business and as an individual given the current situation that we're in. So hopefully my your key takeaway after this short segment is you know what to do. You know what are the opportunities to spot and you can already get going. So the first thing that I want to stress is that e-commerce and e-payments are growing dramatically. We've seen from different companies say that they're like 200%, 300%, 400% increase in adoption of e-payments uh, in e-commerce and e-shopping. So the big question you need to ask yourself first as a business is can you shift to digital? Can you shift to e-commerce? If you are an individual and not necessarily like a business or an SME or you're an employee and you're looking for a side hustle or a side business, the question you need to ask yourself is can you get into e-commerce? Can you get into online selling? Now the misconception is that it is so hard to get into e-commerce that the barriers are incredibly high. 
but there have there are players in the marketplace that have made it much more easier to be able to penetrate the space. Of course, we're taking a look at platforms such as Lazada, Shopee, Shopify, and a bunch of other e-commerce platforms that you know, guys might want to consider if you want to put up your own e-commerce or online business. Now, if you are a large enterprise and you are looking at e-commerce as a possible space, two things you need to take a look at. Number one, obviously, building your own capabilities in your own platform. And number two, establishing trade 2.0. Kung trade mo dati is basically your sari sari stores or your groceries, trade 2.0 is managing your network across all the online distribution marketplaces such as Lazada, Shopee, and the like. So it's like a new way of taking a look at sales. Whereas before, it was all of your agents, you know, it's all of your initial networks. Now it's really all the different online platforms that have sizable uh, audiences already. Now you're probably thinking, how can I mobilize if I don't have talent in my company for that? Or if I don't know a lot of, of digital skills? Here's the key. Uh, the, the digital like economy, or digital is not a skill set. Digital is like the time that we're living in today. And it's open for everybody regardless of your age. Now if you're not an expert, for example, in design, SEO, e-commerce, the web development, but you are, for example, I don't know, maybe in your 40s or late 30s or maybe even in your 50s, but you already have the resources, you have the capital, you have the network, then just hire the experts and just hire the people to get the job done. You don't have to do everything yourself. Right? The key is knowing what needs to get done and being able to build teams to accomplish what they're doing. So again, let me just stress that digital is the new normal, it's the new business, it's the new economy, and it's open for everybody regardless of it. So the first point, e-commerce, e-play payments going up the roof. The second point that I want to stress, and this is something that really excites me, and I hope those who do digital marketing, you guys get excited as well. Online advertising is market driven. That means that if there's a high supply, means a lot of people online, uh, but low demand, which means only a few advertisers willing to spend, the prices of advertising on platforms such as Facebook and Google go down. And that's the current situation. Online advertising today, in the last two months, has been the lowest I have ever seen in my entire career in digital. If you want to place ads on Facebook, if you want to place ads on YouTube or Google or whatever, the costs for placing those ads right now are at an all-time low. What does this mean? This means that your customer acquisition cost today is at its lowest online. So if you actually have the e-commerce platform, if you actually have the online conversion capability, now is the time where you should be spending. Now is the time where you should be hitting the marketplace and getting people to try out your app, to download your app, to make their first purchase, to sign up to whatever it is that you built. Because customer acquisition, especially from a consumer standpoint, so we're targeting mass audiences, is at its absolute lowest. In fact, that's the reason why, and personally, I'm, I'm, I'm dabbling a lot now into e-commerce and side hustles in that space because it's just so much cheaper now to be able to go out to the market and to build communities and to build businesses. So if you are fortunate, if you are lucky to have capital, if you have the money to, to spend to be able to grow your business or SME, now is the time to do so. Uh, guys, you need, to accel you need to step on the gas and accelerate. You need to learn now, make your mistakes because the price of learning is at its lowest because when prices go up then obviously uh, it will be more expensive to make those mistakes and it will be more expensive to acquire your customers so if you have that unique opportunity if you have that window today you should be doing that and the third point i'd like to stress is that digital is like a rabbit hole there are lots of twists a lot of turns sometimes you, you just fall into a tunnel and you don't know what you can find then that's the nature of the beast. Because if you take a look at digital, there's so many things that you can do. I barely scratched the surface when I talked about e-commerce, e-payment, as well as online advertising and customer acquisition costs. I haven't even gone into uh, chatbots, email marketing, uh, cracking influencer marketing, building your own affiliate marketing system. Uh, and, and there's just so much more being able to take advantage of artificial intelligence and machine learning. I mean, if, if you're really just limited by your imagination and your capability when it comes to what you can do 
on the device. The value that you can unlock by automating a lot of things is immense in terms of savings and efficiencies for the companies that you run or for the companies that you guys will build. The reality is ad tech is advancing so much faster than the capabilities of marketers and entrepreneurs. So the opportunity there is for you and for me and for everybody watching today is that if you take the pains of building your digital muscle now, if you take the pains of putting in the work, making the mistakes, learning, checking out all the different applications and all the different platforms that you can take advantage of, you will be well positioned to succeed in the digital age. Because ultimately, survival is not an option. If you're the type of person who wants to thrive, if you're the type of person that really wants to provide a, a good life, not just for yourself, but for your family and your employees, then it's the best time to really take a look at digital and technology. And with that said, that's happy for my segment, and I wish all of you... Okay. Thank you very much, Carlo. Okay, we'll look forward to seeing how things keep going with you in the future. Okay, our next speaker, we have Alex Cabrera. Alex is the chairman and uh, senior partner of PwC Philippines. This is the second largest audit and advisory firm in the nation. More than a thousand employees have been a fast grower over the past few years, and also particularly strong at using technology in its business and for its employees. So it's a bit of a star in that regard. And certainly in the region, uh, Alex uh, and his group have really put Philippines on the map um, as a fast grower, and he was put on the board of uh, PwC Southeast Asia Regional Consulting Practice and other achievements. So we're very glad to have Alex with us today for an interesting uh, uh, story as well. Please welcome Alex Cabrera. <laughs> Glad to have you with us, Alex. <clears throat> yep, so uh, yeah, thank you for uh, having me here today. PwC uh, as an organization has always been concerned uh, about building trust in society and uh, uh, solving important problems. So we are a firm that is very uh, stakeholder centric and uh, when we work, we think not only of our staff, our clients, we also think of our, um, uh, the ecosystem where we operate. So we work with governments, with NGOs, uh, social enterprises, uh, and communities, you know, always trying to uh, implement our advocacy of inclusion and uh, sustainability. And then on March, uh, mid-March, uh, the quarantine happened, and of course, this all this pandemic uh, uh, situation happened to us. And uh, and I thought I would I wasn't worried then about the continuity of our uh, work. We invested uh, so much in uh, technology; we know that we can do it. Uh, you know, but I would be uh, kidding, and I would be pretending if I I don't say that uh, I got worried about our people. Um, the keeping the employment of our people uh, in in that kind of uh, environment, uh, in a, an environment that is going into a recession, I was trying to look for um, the end game, and so that was the first decision that uh, I needed to do as the uh, CEO of the firm. I talked to my partners, and I I, I told my partners, "This is where the rubber uh, meets the road," and um, you know, can we? Can we bring uh, caring for our people to life and uh, tell them that we are um, not terminating anybody? We are going to keep the employment. They're, we're going to keep paying their salaries and uh, pay what is due them, even in uh, in profit share, uh, if we can. And so that decision was uh, was made. Um, we're keeping all our people, and uh, uh, partner said that you know we're paying for productive time and. Uh, we thought that keeping our people productive is the risk of uh, business owners or or the partners. So that is what we what we did. And even as we are worry, worrying about uh, productivity, we couldn't uh, take our eyes off on what is happening in the in the front lines. So the firm immediately went into uh, CSR mode and uh, uh, began um, these um, donations to uh, hospitals to our uh, to our frontliners. Um, and you know we, we got these uh, uh, messages 
of things from them and you know it's it's really humbling it's uh, it's uh, happy and sad at the same time because they're thanking you upon they're saying thanks uh, great thanks for a pack of uh, lunch and you know they're they're laying their lives and they're thanking you for a pack of lunch and and i thought that we can we can do better and uh, you know the immediate thing that we can think of is uh, summon our people you know create this video prayers uh, online and uh, and we 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 sent them that to them as well but truth be told the firm was firing on all cylinders we were conducting our services we were even more productive than we were uh, pre covid because of the technology our work involved uh, a lot of waiting time sometimes and all that waiting time is taken out you know because um, people are charging based on productive time where we've gone to a 40 hour uh, work week and doesn't matter how you consume that uh, Uh, 40 hours, and so the the waiting time is also uh, taken out uh, from that. And I think one one testament that uh, we have been uh, serving our clients well, um, testament to that is how we serve uh, Globe Telecom Inc., uh, one of our new accounts, and even Ernest Ku was uh, uh, all praises about how we did our work, uh, the transition. This is uh, supposed to be a very uh, difficult uh, thing to do. Um, and how we reviewed their their first uh, quarter uh, results uh, discussed with the board discussed with management and all that happened all that happened uh, virtually and online and all the audit uh, happened uh, online of course uh, you know true to form we're not always uh, all work we we had uh, fun we try to have fun also in the office we try to uh, catch what our people are are doing at home of course we monitor their health we have uh, that uh, Uh, tracker, uh, their health tracker that's reported on a daily basis, and uh, we know who among our people are um, PUMs or or PUIs, and uh, you know, um, uh, thanks to God, uh, none of our people were seriously afflicted with the uh, with the COVID virus, you know. But uh, we we have this uh, game uh, still ongoing uh, contest in in the in the firm where people send their pictures uh, and how they look at home. And we have these pictures where they're cooking, they're exercising, um, and they're doing uh, wh- whatever they are doing at home. They're they're sending these pictures, and that's just uh, keeping our uh, close community to, uh, to together, and uh, you know having a glimpse eye view, even if we're not um, uh, seeing each other on a daily basis. You know, as, at at least through the pictures that our people send, you know, we're we're like uh, uh, having a glimpse of them uh, at home. So it's this uh, contest is called, called "This Is Me," uh, work from home. It's still ongoing, and uh, we're receiving a lot of uh, very interesting uh, figures. Still true to form, we're uh, trying to help uh, where we can. Uh, we did uh, some infographics uh, uh, sent to the Bureau of Internal Revenue, sent to all our clients. It's about uh, paying your taxes while staying at home. Um, paying your taxes and not falling in line, and we have uh, infographics for individual payments and uh, uh, corporate uh, tax payments. And now is a good time to share. So we shared also our tools. Uh, one of our important tools is the digital uh, fitness app, um, where you can assess uh, the level of your digital fitness and uh, even uh, even use some of the uh, training assistance in in this app. Um, it's um, it's it's now an open source and uh, anyone can use it. Uh, we we also shared our uh, COVID uh, uh, tracker uh, app. Um, it's still true to form, uh, even on an online business. We're we're still working so much with government, with the DOT, with the DTI, um, uh, other government agencies, and we came up with the uh, very useful uh, in uh, thought leadership materials and reports. Coming from uh, situationers or surveys uh, from uh, from tech startups, from those involved in uh, uh, tourism establishments, from MSMEs, and we build that report, that data, and and share that uh, to the public uh, as well. I think the message uh, the message here is that uh, you cannot be someone online if you are not uh, like that firm uh, offline. And I think the the reason that we are able to do what uh, we're able to do um, in a work from home arrangement or in a remote uh, uh, working arrangement is that we have always been like this as a firm, and uh, living our values, uh, 
living our purpose of building trust in society and uh, helping solve important problems, uh, that wouldn't stop uh, regardless of the situation. Uh, we've always valued uh, the, this uh, value of uh, agility and we will we'll, we'll always work in an agile manner and we will adapt to, uh, to the situation. My only uh, desire is that the behavior continues for everybody. All the positive things that we picked up uh, in this uh, COVID scenario, I hope that we leverage on that and use that as uh, with a lot of positivity, with God's grace uh, in a post-COVID scenario. Thank you everyone for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. That's a good story. And I know uh, we've different, a lot of people work with uh, him and his group these days. So it's nice. I know even our PLDT friends we have and so forth. So keep up your good work, Alex and friends. And we'll look forward to hearing more in the future. Okay, our next speaker is Patrick Gentry. He's the CEO of Sprout Solutions. If you don't know, they've become now the dominant tech solution for HR and payroll uh, um, processes. And it's an example of we, we felt strongly they needed to be part of the event so they can really, because they're a good example of systems that really do enable work from anywhere. They've won various awards and so forth. It is difficult for many companies to know what to pay and remit for their employees. So this has been a big breakthrough for average business owners, all business owners. So glad to have him. Please welcome Patrick Gentry. And there he is. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> yeah, and all my uh, bearded glory. That's my uh, COVID look. So uh, thanks, Richard and Rebecca and Asia CEO for having me. Um, yeah, it, it's it's an incredibly big issue these days. Uh, I think it's amazing the number of companies that have told us, you know, we really had a digital strategy that was going to take three or four years, and we just executed it in three or four weeks <laughs> because of COVID. So I think the whole um, uh, situation has dramatically impacted the roadmap for, for a ton of businesses here in the Philippines. Uh, and and we've had a seen a, a tremendous amount of interest because of that. So I want to talk about a few things today. Uh, you know, we throughout the crisis, we've done a few surveys uh, through our system. Uh, just a little background: we have HR and payroll technology uh, that companies use here to automate these complicated processes, uh, and we have over a hundred thousand users in the system now. And so. Uh, when we do a survey in the system, it'll get over 10,000 responses. And we've done a number of, of these surveys uh, around work from home, around technology. Um, I wanted to share a few stats from that. So some of the things that were really interesting were, you know, over 75% of respondents said that they had the equipment that they needed, they had the tools that they needed, uh, they had the the collaborative um, the collaboration uh, tools that they needed to have really high quality interactions with fellow workers. Um, so that was really interesting. I think we we got a lot of positive feedback from this. Again, we had we had over ten thousand responses across two hundred and fifty companies just in the Philippines, uh, and so we had quite a large sample size to to gather this data. Uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, workers felt like the vast majority of, of employees felt like they were productive working from home. Uh, they had good interactions. Uh, a few uh, on the more negative, on the things that cropped up that were issues, um, the number one issue that was raised was internet connectivity. Uh, a lot of workers struggle with uh, intermittent internet or, or a lack of internet connection. Um, I know even just in Sprout, uh, we had to provide uh, pocket Wi-Fi devices for some of our employees who had no internet at home. And I think a lot of companies are in that situation. Um, another thing that, uh, two other things that popped up as as big issues were uh, laptops, uh, having laptops at home and being able to connect to the workplace. Um, and that's through, a lot of companies have these security protocols and being able to enable work from home through these security protocols uh, was a bit of a challenge. But 
but yeah, the, the results from these surveys were really, were really, really uh, positive overall. And I'm happy to share those. Um, anybody listening who, who wants to uh, send an email to info at sprout.ph and you can get a copy of these surveys because um, they're quite informative. Uh, one thing that popped up that was quite interesting was um, of all the, of uh, everybody surveyed, the Gen Z, which are the youngest individuals surveyed, ha- reported the biggest uh, problems with concentrating and distractions in work from home. We were expecting it more in the millennials or late millennials, uh, like uh, Gen Y, um, who have kids at home and maybe distracted by their kids and, and things like that. But it was really the youngest people that were were quite uh, distracted working from home. So I think I don't know what that says about uh, our future uh, uh, as humanity, but it's it's pretty interesting. So. So yeah, um, this survey was really interesting. Some of the another thing that came up was uh, HR folks really, really struggled with tools that they could use remote um, to help automate these HR and payroll tasks. Uh, and we were very quick to respond to that. Um, the way that I see it, uh, for our company, our responsibility is to help companies thrive during this time as much as we can because we're a tech company. We have a cloud-based HR and payroll system. It's perfectly set up for this scenario. Uh, And so really quickly, we launched something called the Rescue Kit, which is uh, 60 days free access to HR and payroll uh, of Sprout. Um, Companies get, uh, they also have Instacash bundled in, which provides finances to employees who need uh, quick access to finances. Uh, we also include BCP expert consultation there. This is more applicable in the in the early part of the crisis. But um, and and the goal with that is just to help. There's no commitment, no um, no strings attached or anything like that. We just said, look, while you're while you're on work from home, uh, use Sprout for free for 60 days, uh, and and we can talk at the end of that if you're happy. Um, so that was something that we launched. Uh, quite quite early. Another thing that came out of the survey that I wanted to highlight here was a ton of companies struggle with uh, following government guidelines. Like there have been so many issuances from the government, from Dole, from BIR, from, <clears throat> from all these uh, uh, organization, uh, government bodies. Um, so keeping that all straight has been a huge challenge for businesses. And, and we do Sprout has started these twice weekly webinars um, because this is our area of expertise. So uh, we have HR and legal experts. We have a legal team in-house with deep HR background, and we're very deeply uh, in touch with these government agencies like Dole, um, BIR, SSS, Pagibig, PhilHealth. Um, these are all agencies that have all kinds of updates coming out all the time, and we're we're really abreast of those. So. I would just encourage companies that have questions, please lean on resources like us um, because we're here to help and we have the expertise to do that. So um, again, if you have anybody with legal HR questions, um, reach out to uh, info at sprout.ph is a great channel. We'll, we'll get back to you and help you with that. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I wanted to, to come out here and say, you know, um, we're, this is a time for everybody to do what they can to help other businesses and other individuals. Uh, and our area of expertise is, is digital HR and payroll. So um, so we're here to help. Thanks, Richard. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And I got to say, you're looking very fashionable with your, uh, <laughs> your My wife yeah. demanded she cut my hair, so I uh, yeah. had to accept. But Yeah, it's my excuse to grow it out, I guess. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker also has uh, hair a little bit longer than I've ever seen before. But uh, David L. Moral is, oh, he's known in the business community as bossing janitor. He started as a janitor earlier in in his career and later, uh, more recently, built uh, what I would say is, uh, well, certainly one of the nation's most important tech companies. and he's, I know he's built a, a Google-like campus for his employees in Paranaque that uh, 
a lot of people are interested to, to, to see. I've certainly toured it and I found it very interesting, I gotta tell you. And doing good work helping governments and large organizations in Philippines to automate and digitize. So it's important work that he does. Um, so glad to have you, David. We'll look forward to uh, an update on how you're doing through all this. Please welcome David Elmeral. Hi, Richard. Thank you again for the very exaggerated uh, introduction, as always. <laughs> anyway, thank you everyone for joining us here at Asia CEO Tech Forum. So our, uh, you know, uh, when the pandemic pandemic happened, uh, every everyone was caught on guard, to be honest. You know, all of us were, were not ready, actually. A lot of businesses from uh, different industries uh, need to readjust, you know, remodel. Uh, it's like uh, you have to renovate everything that you do now because of this uh, unexpected uh, pandemic. And uh, some need to totally change the way they, uh, they do things now, especially in, uh, in a lot of businesses, uh, especially in different industries. Coming from a perspective of a business owner, uh, to be honest, the first question in my, in my mind was uh, how can we survive, you know, all know I'm like a necessity to everyone, but uh, there's a lot of things come in my head that not only to survive as a company, but how are we able also to to like uh, uh, survive with our partners? Because uh, we, we only survive if our partners will survive. I don't believe that uh, we can stand alone in this kind of uh, of new normal. Okay. Uh, one of the biggest question is actually uh, uh, how can you work from everywhere? Okay, so uh, do your life work from everywhere? So right now. Uh, 50% of our employees, they are now working from home. Although we have our own campus where our programmers and uh, IT engineers, they stay in our campus. So uh, we have to provide them everything, their, their food, their uh, accommodation and everything that they need, we have to provide. But most of them now, they are working from home. So it's quite an adjustment because uh, we intend to be like a close family, you know, in Multisys. Uh, we are like uh, brothers and sisters here working together hand in hand, discussing ideas in a face-to-face -face manner. But when this pandemic happened, we have to readjust and we have to use now virtual uh, uh, collaboration uh, tools. Uh, so it's, it's quite funny because uh, it's like it doesn't change anything because we are a technology uh, company. So we're able to adjust so quickly. Uh, to be honest, everyone now, in, even in the business, uh, all kinds of business industries, you, you name one, everyone wanted to have their own digital play. So they always have to have one before they don't like uh, prioritize having their own digital play because they can still survive having this physical business, right? But nowadays, everyone is like, I need to have a website. I need to have a mobile app. I need to have my online uh, uh, payment. I need to have my online e-delivery services. I have to have my own uh, digital play. So for IT companies, uh, just to share to you our model, we're focusing into five E's, okay, five E's. So first it's called the, uh, the e-business. In business, you would like to focus on that because you would like to empower a lot of businesses so that they'll be able to have their own digital play. So we don't want to be one of them, but we would like to be like to become one of their tools or to become their, their enabler for them to have their own digital play, whatever industry you are in. Second is we have this e-technology. Last year, we're able to, uh, to uh, 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 create our own department, uh, a new department called the e-technology uh, business, meaning we're focusing on the IoT, on the artificial intelligence, uh, chatbots, et cetera, et cetera, which is, I think it will become very important nowadays. Third, we have the e-government uh, platforms and uh, we're quite known in terms of like empowering some government agency and to provide the ease of doing business. So e-government nowadays will become very important because not only on like uh, uh, e-commerce, but also in e-delivery services, uh, including the e-certificates. Uh, recently, we just launched the uh, end-to-end the, -end, the smart city of Manila so it's a total paperless system that you don't need to go to city hall and process your real property tax, business permit, your even your clearances, even your barangay clearance, even your cedula, even your uh, sanitary permit, construction permit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And a lot of people think that it was impossible before, but now it's possible because of this uh, technology that uh, that uh, somehow uh, we contributed to. Uh, to develop. Uh, fourth, we have the e-commerce. Uh, I know that e-commerce will become the biggest business, especially with this new norm, because people don't want to hold any more cash in their hand. They would like to use digital platforms to pay their bills, to pay their uh, uh, contributions, insurance, uh, government bills, etc., etc. So e-commerce will become a very big uh, entity. That's why we're focusing on that E. Okay. Lastly, we have the e-services. 
Easier Success will become a new play because since there's a lot of physical businesses that will be affected, and I think we Filipinos can still survive because we're very, uh, let's call it creative. Filipinos are very creative. And uh, the moment that we are into the e-services, uh, we, we can still adjust because we can convert those physical services to become like an e-services, the likes of telehealth, or before you need a doctor to be in front of you. Now you can just use a telehealth for you to talk to your doctor. So if you are in a academic business, so uh, instead of you uh, like, uh, your professor or teacher is teaching in front of you. Now you can do it online by using virtual tools to do that. So like a, an e-learning tools, okay. The company, Multisys has been very steadfast in seeking a greater digital transformation for the Philippines. And that's what we always said because, uh, you know, it's nice that uh, we can see that our platform are being used by millions of Filipinos and we're helping them process easily, you know. So uh, through this system design, development and deployment, we would like to focus on system automation services that can smoothly expedite various processes and transactions. Our, mi our mission is to become an enabler. We don't want to be like a, a, a competition to everyone. That's why we develop the smart cities, uh, we develop smart enterprises, we develop smart government platforms, we have smart community platforms, a new platform that we develop to assist a lot of communities, uh, real estates, et cetera, et cetera. We also have the smart billing and collection. This is very important now since people cannot go out and pay their bills. So we, we develop a, a QR code payment with e-billing by SMS and e-collection services uh, 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 connected to our uh, uh, e-commerce partners. And the new one is the smart technologies. This smart technologies, which all together would reinforce uh, ease of doing business across the archipelago. So uh, my, 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 my decision uh, personally in Multisys is we should remain and act as a technology enabler to everyone. Infusion of a certain tech play can help companies from different industries, whether you are in formation technology, maybe you are in the government, uh, healthcare, utility, retail, academia, banking and finance, and even in hospitality businesses. So they need to have their own tech play. So we would like to be one of their enabler. Now, everyone got to have their own digital play. Let's face that. Uh, digitally, techno digital technologies are basically radically transforming the business landscape nowadays, reshaping the nature of work, services, operations, promotions, logistics, and even boundaries and responsibilities of various enterprises. And the current health crisis has changed the game further taking things into new heights, right? So, uh, uh, so that's what we, uh, we do. So uh, anyway, so uh, that's our uh, contribution uh, that we would like to empower a lot of businesses. Thank you, Richard, and uh, I hope uh, uh, that means uh, uh, that has relevance to this uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you very much, David. And yes, I don't know whether I'm okay to invite people out to see your beautiful facility in Paranaque. I don't want people to come up in a big uh, crowds or anything, but it is something to see if ever you get invited. So yeah, they've done a lot of interesting work. So we'll look forward to seeing David continuing his success in the future. So thank you very much, uh, uh, David. Okay, our next speaker is Andres Ortola. He's the general manager of Microsoft. And uh, ah, pleased to have him. He runs arguably the world's most successful technology company here in Philippines. I know he's worked, he originally comes from Argentina, not today, but that's where his parents produced him uh, uh, so to speak, and he's worked in different parts of the world and, and uh, jumped at the opportunity to, uh, to to run the Philippine operations here. And uh, Microsoft has always had a, a place in my heart. I, earlier in my career, I, I used um, Microsoft products uh, as a tech manager, but, and as a coincidence, we're using the Microsoft Teams software uh, for this event. Uh, Andres will be pleased to 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 know. Uh, so let's hear Andres with an interesting story. Please welcome Andres Ortola. Welcome, Andres. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for the introduction and the references. How long ago I left my my home country? Um, you're right. I mean, technology has been at the leading edge uh, of of everything that's been happening in this crisis. What you would say. Uh, uh, this, the, what we call the MPI, the non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions around the world to try to, to combat COVID. And we have learned a lot 
uh, around the world and on things that could be done to the possibilities that our technology would re- will bring and to the limits that we, we could ourselves stretch that technology in that scale to serve uh, the world in this time of crisis. So I wanted to share a little bit of our learnings today, some some of our views into into what the new normal, as we call it, and uh, and a couple of learnings that that we've seen here in the Philippines in particular. So when you look at the new normal, uh, this there's definitely se- several new scenarios that are becoming more and more common. When you think about social distancing. Uh, and and the scale that has that this has to be controlled around the world. If you think about contact tracing, just David from from Multisys just now was talking, and we've been working with, on say, StaySafe.ph. It's just one example of the many contact tracing initiatives that have, have happened all around the world. I think the biggest learning for everybody is how big the scale is when you really intend to track that many people and try to uh, help them keep to keep safe. If you think about curbside pickup, you know, uh, you said it a couple of times this morning, Richard, Manila's traffic, it's always been a, a, a problem to be dealt with. Now, all of a sudden, we realize that not only it's possible by, by adding some working from home, remote working technologies, uh, it's possible and it's actually very beneficial in many, many ways. In fact, uh, we at Microsoft, we've been running this initiative for sustainability, and long before the, the the ECQ restrictions, we were already in the initiative of working a couple of days from home. If you think about it, about uh, if, if a company of 100 people decides to work from home one or two days a week, that would be around seven tons of carbon being eliminated per year from the atmosphere. It's just a big, big number. Uh, for us to 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 sink and to 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 absorb when you think about it, thinking about cleaning protocols and other things that we need to continue paying attention to. I think that the 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 pervasive uh, observation here is how technology will become a, a key driver of this. How to get, use technology to scale on these solutions. If you look at remote working, I guess our learning here. Uh, as we started to remote working, I think we have to redefine the category so many times. Uh, first, we look at it's not just remote working. It's, it's it's more specific than that. It's remote selling, remote servicing, remote HR, uh, remote developing. Uh, you can think of telemedicine, learning. Uh, all these things come together will require a customization, a, an adaptability of those tools uh, for us to move forward. In fact, we we talk about hybrid uh, uh, hybrid um, workplace right now, just to to, to th- refer to the the new normal of environments being virtual and physical, at least for the foreseeable future. So I think uh, most of these things are here to stay. I think our key our key thought here is technology will be the enabler of this next phase. There's no chance that we can achieve uh, what we are aiming to and to try to reactivate economies and reactivate ecosystems without technology. And we, we are, we're hopeful uh, of, of the future, uh, not just in the world, but also for the Philippines. Uh, we've seen perhaps two years of digital transformation happening in about two months, Richard. It's been amazing how companies really took up the challenge and, and stepped up to the, to, to the situation. When it comes to learnings, I think I will probably summarize it in a couple of key learnings. Of course, there is there's many, many things that we can talk about. But to me, a key concepts could be the importance of staying connected. You know, um, we have we had the tools for, for remote connectivity for quite some time. But it has been until now that we needed to put them in, in, in the benefit of that deep connection, the human beings need. Uh, that deep connection, how to enable better ways of connecting. Just an example, very close to my heart. Uh, about last week, in the last two, three weeks, we worked with Depit to host the first ever online graduation um, events for, for children. There's a very special moment for families, for children. And we tried to, to you know, wrap a whole experience around the remote uh, uh, connectivity which I think it delivered great value. We're looking into many, many more of those graduations to happen uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the near future. The second is that, that 
this collaboration tool set that will that will bring organizations together. If you think about collaboration, it's not just the fact that we're talking today, but the fact that we can chat, that we can art, that we can raise uh, questions, that we can share documents. It's, it's, it's a more complex um, concept itself. A very very interesting case, and very very um, you know humbling case was the 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 justice department initiative to enable for the first time ever in the Philippines virtual court hearings. Uh, you know, Richard, from April 30th, in the, in the first two weeks of, of, of this virtual hearings being, uh, being uh, online, we've seen more than 4,600 people recover their freedom just because of the process that was told before could happen in this new environment. This is great, it's a great innovation and great value and transformation that it's, it's here to stay. I don't think uh, we will ever go back to the state that we were before. Last but not least, my last learning would be act fast, move with agility, bringing people along and creating that agility in your organization. Uh, we work with police. The police department gave us a phone call. We need to be able to orchestrate all our checkpoints uh, personnel all across Metro Manila and I think world, uh, countrywide. How to do this in, in, in a matter of a day or hours? Our teams and theirs work together and put something really, really fast and efficient to, to manage the, the situation in a matter of hours. So record time, I would say. The key question would be, how do we as leaders enable organizations to be able to continue keeping at this rapid pace? Because the demands are going to continue being this fast. We need to enable this agility in our organizations. And that will be the key uh, for us to move forward. And uh, I'll finish with, uh, with a thought that I really like, a quote, I was said uh, many, many years ago by Mr. Winston Churchill, a pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity and an optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. And no secret to anybody, we've been put through a, a big, big amount of difficulties uh, nowadays. So my encouragement to leadership, to leaders in the, in the school today is continue leading with empathy and, and vision to, to make sure we make uh, the most opportunity of all, uh, the difficulty we have in front of us. Thanks, Richard, and thanks everybody for having me. Thank you very much, Andres. Yeah, virtual court sessions, that is wonderful. So that's exactly the kinds of opportunities we wanna see more of in the future. Thank you very much, Andres. And uh, we'll look forward to getting you know better. I know I've been hearing more about your work here, so uh, uh, very good work. Thank you. Okay. So we've heard some good technology stories. And now we all know though, that everything depends on data security. If we don't have data security, none of this is gonna work. It's all just uh, good talk. So we're so pleased today to have Raymond Laboro, the commissioner and national privacy, uh, commissioner of national privacy for the nation. Um, and yeah, it's an important issue because like Nico said, there's always somebody in our organization who will click anything. And also the, the phenomenon of the disgruntled employee. Leaving a company can be a very emotional thing. And sometimes employees will do things that are, you know, that they regret later. But, we, but the company needs to be able to protect itself from these kinds of things. So very glad to have Raymond Laboro. Please welcome the country's national privacy commissioner. Thank you, Richard, and I'd like to thank you and Rebecca for inviting me over again for the second straight year, and congratulations to the Asia CEO Forum. It's been a fascinating morning listening to all the speakers, and uh, really uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the messages that they have been uh, putting forward really resonates in today's uh, times. And I would just like to zero in on uh, basically the two major things that I have gathered so far. And that is really, well, the, uh, the role of technology uh, in this uh, pandemic and also uh, more importantly in the post-crisis uh, uh, period. And uh, also, again, the role of uh, businesses and developers and those who are actually, as I've uh, heard Andreas and uh, uh, Patrick, uh, with the introduction of technology and applications to uh, enable 
uh, our citizens to not only survive and probably flourish in the future in this new environment. Um, as you see, you know, this pandemic is a very unfamiliar pand uh, familiar times for the country. And it's been 60 days since we started the lockdown. This has actually taught us a lot of things and a lot of uh, lessons. Um, you know, uh, with the advent of COVID-19, we have an unprecedented change in the society as we know it. And as we slowly adapt to the new normal, we have resorted to online solutions for usual activities, such as talking with our loved ones, shopping, buying food, and of course, uh, working. Uh, one thing that cannot be not denied here is that overnight we've become digital or everyone became digital. And along with this paradigm shift, however, uh, is the growing probability of uh, data breach, misuse of information, and irresponsible distribution of data. But you see, Richard, from the beginning, um, uh, well, we at the National Privacy Commission have actually taken the posture of both an enabler and a protector when all these public health emergencies started. And as an enabler, we thought that best to actually, well, enable our government and the private sector in effectively responding to the pandemic. A result, as a result of that, we have actually issued already 13 bulletins to guide not only the government, but everyone in here in the country, especially what we call controllers and processors, basically companies and their organizations. Um, really, uh, you know, this invitation came really at an opportune time because this week we are uh, commemorating a Privacy Awareness Week. And uh, this is uh, done through a presidential proclamation 527 signed by our president. And this year we are uh, focusing on what we call enabling trust in the new normal and uh, reimagining privacy in these times. So as Andres said that, uh, well, yes, I, we, uh, I, I believe that technology will be an enabler, but it should be qualified too. Trusted technology would be the most important element here. And uh, it's now up to the, uh, the innovators, your companies, uh, the entrepreneur, even the startups, to make sure that the technology and the applications that you will be introducing in this time and beyond must be trusted. So, uh, you know, uh, say uh, to remind everyone again uh, uh, that because I, I heard of so many applications that everyone is trying to introduce, and even the e court or e uh, those court hearings online, these are all again uh, uh, not only um, trailblazing but uh, actually liberating uh, for, for people. So, let me just remind everyone that uh, especially our uh, tech uh, operators, our controllers, our businessmen, and those present here today about establishing trust is, uh, I think, very important in this new environment. So if you process information that allows the identification or the, an individual to be identified, then you need to comply with the Data Privacy Act of 2012. That means handling personal information fairly, lawfully, and with transparency. And personal data that relates to health, uh, I must remind you, is actually classified as sensitive personal information, and it must even be more handled with care and uh, protection. You know, the Data Privacy Act of 2012 actually does not prevent everyone here from the taking the necessary steps to adapt to the new normal. <clears throat> and, uh, but, uh, you know, with the added reminder, that we're all here in this new environment and it is our duty and responsibility to keep the public safe and uh, supported in these times. Uh, but again, the requirement here is for you to be responsible with people's personal data and ensure, and ensure uh, that you are handling it with care. Make sure that you understand your lawful basis before you start any processing activity and that you have the processes and procedures in place to keep information safe and secure. To those that have followed the National Privacy Commission or PANTRA has always been simple. If you can't protect it, then don't collect it. And it still applies very much to this new normal. So as a reminder, as a, uh, as a checklist uh, to all uh, our, our guests and viewers and our co-panelists, when you are about to launch or even think of a business concept during this time, may I remind you to ask the following questions. 
have you adopted a privacy by design approach in your business model or in your technology? <clears throat> Excuse me. Have you conducted an assessment of the privacy risks involved? And is this assessment up to date? Have you addressed the security and safeguards of the tech boosted business models that you are introducing? Have you had an open and constructive engagement with your DPO or your data protection officer? And are you being transparent with your users? Have you included a clear privacy policy or statement or notice, which is actually required by law? And are you being transparent in a way that facilitates trust? I guess these are again, uh, some of the questions uh, which I uh, am heavily uh, uh, suggesting that everyone take uh, before, uh, again, uh, we, uh, we deploy or we launch and we develop uh, these technologies which I, and you know, with all the, uh, uh, with, even with, good, with our good intentions, uh, and uh, again, with the, uh, with the uh, interest, and of course the innovative spirit that uh, Filipinos have, I'm sure we will come up with technologies and solutions and applications that again, will not only uh, make people safe in this uh, pandemic, but probably again, um, propel this country and uh, not only survive, but probably flourish for our country to flourish in the coming months and trying years. Thank you, Richard. Very good. Thank you very much, Raymond. Yes, it's not easy to be the nation's first uh, national privacy commissioner. So we wish you well. I know he's already putting the Philippines on the map in data security. So we really appreciate the work you're doing. It's very, very important, but not easy as we all know. Okay, thank you again, Raymond. So now we'll have time for some questions and always kind of the highlight of our events. And we've got a lot of interesting questions today. So please hang on, watch this little clip and we'll be right back. Key in your questions, comments and suggestions via the chat. Okay, very good. Glad to have everybody here. And uh, well, let's uh, we'll just get started with a question. I know with Nico, he had some interesting points, but the interesting thing with uh, his group is they've delivered thousands of devices to people's homes just to enable them to continue working and so forth. But Nico, what are your customers telling you about working from home in the future? Do you think people will actually split their time between the office and the home after the crisis, or will they just go back to the old way of doing things? What, what do you think? Uh, thanks for the question, Richard, and that's a very interesting one and very relevant today. Um, but maybe I'd like to begin by um, some feedback or some, um, some general sentiments from our customers when all of this started. Um, there was a general sense of being unprepared. And um, what's surprising was that most of them did have business continuity plans, but a lot, of the, a lot of them were untested. So these were plans that were designed around compliance and built on a just-in-case mindset. So these are the kind of plans that are difficult to operationalize. And two main issues really rose um, when all of this began. One was really access from home. So proactively, our network team really had to re-engineer our network such that bandwidth capacity can be reallocated to residential areas from the central business districts. So a lot of that had to do with the tweaking of bandwidth, increasing frequencies, and making sure that there was enough um, there was enough connectivity to make employees productive. Um, second, we, as you mentioned, we delivered thousands of pocket Wi-Fi um, to BPOs, to banks, and to other industries. We even had to deliver some laptops. So um, uh, a lot of the banking institutions today um, do not really allow their employees to work from home or take home data due to the sensitivity of the uh, of the system. So um, having laptops at home was quite a, a big a big change in how they operated. Um, another thing that we saw was really how learning institutions began to fast track their need for um, e-learning. 
So uh, learning management systems. And just as a note, uh, the same Teams platform that we are using today is also what we had offered our um, educational institution clients because there's Teams for education. We're also working with Multisys, um, which has Schoolbox, um, another um, school management system that's quite important as schools need to automate. Now, um, apart from access from home, the second issue really they had was that their operations was not tuned for work from home. So it was quite um, it was quite apparent in the manufacturing sector because more than 80% of their employees really needed to be at the production line rather than at home. Um, also, systems were not reachable outside of the corporate network, and a lot of the processes were really manual and needed physical documents. So there was a lot of re-engineering in processes and in ways of working that needed to happen. Now, the way we tried to support them was to really provide three trials, free trials for platforms. So we've provided free trials for our cloud platforms, our own contact center as a solution, our own endpoint security, and security operations as a service. Um, it was really about just providing them access and helping them out, um, tie them through the next three months. And by experiencing it okay. firsthand, we're really hoping that they would find that the benefits far outweigh the costs. And there's real value in these solutions to help them compete. Right. Okay, very good. Okay, Nico. And I know Carlo, he's, you know, Carlo, you got the reputation of being up on all of the new technology and so forth. What are other things that you've heard of that people can use? I mean, we use um, uh, Microsoft Teams, a lot of people use Zoom as well. But what are others that, that you think can help people in this new work from anywhere future we have? I think when it comes to like new uh, tools, one of the key things that you should look at is does it automate specific tasks that you do? Uh, primarily because it will mean less physical interaction and less time uh, to get done, which means you're more efficient and that you're safe, right? Especially in the current situation that we're in, wherein we're trying to practice social distancing as much as possible. So what are some examples of tools that automate stuff? So I'll talk about on the marketing side and maybe on the operation side. So from the marketing side, you can take a look at different programs that allow for you to create chatbots to help with customer service or to help navigate different types of products uh, and solutions that you have to offer or for you to be able to have that you know, one-on-one -on -one digital experience to close the sale a little bit better versus like a straight out ad. On the advertising side, you have A-B testing for you to be able to figure out which ad works the best versus manually taking a look at all the reports and trying to adjust the creative one by one. There are a lot of uh, applications these days that allow for you to actually test different kinds of creatives when you're doing your advertising. And then the program itself will optimize and fix it by itself. So that's kind of cool. Uh, on the operation side, what are the things that you can do to automate reports? Sometimes just doing the, the report takes up so much time. So what kinds of dashboards can you guys create for your businesses, especially if you are moving into e-commerce and into the digital age? Because one of the key things that you should know is that as you enter digital, what you get is a wealth of data and information. And that data is the one that will provide you that added oomph to be able to get the job done and to get it you know, done better. So you need to have those reports are in real time. You need to be able to have access to those reports fast. And if you will create like a sweatshop of people to create those reports, it just doesn't work that way anymore. So what are the different types of applications and programs that you can do that? And of course, you can take a look at HR processes. You can take a look at whatever type of processes that can be automated and just reduce basically physical uh, interaction so that you're safer and at the same time, again, you're more efficient. So that's the key word, automation. Okay, okay, interesting. Okay, so a lot more we can do with that. Now, maybe if, if I could ask our uh, token accountant here, I, I, I mean, I should, that's not the way to put it, because he's quite a senior uh, guy for, you know, very senior situations he, he helps people with. But you are, you know, a business owner yourself with a large enterprise. Now, but from a cost savings, like, like we've heard about companies, you know, de delivering devices to people's homes and so forth. Is what about cost side? Because there, there's going to be some people watching this and say, "Oh God, what about the cost for all of this?" But if 
technology is or people are working from home are the co- are there actual cost savings or are we just moving costs from one place to another what's what's your experience with that uh, alex oh, oh you're talking to me richard because i i'm looking at myself more as a lawyer than an accountant but uh, okay. yeah okay well, yeah what is uh, more costly working in the office is a luxury uh, in terms of of uh, cost versus working at home uh, but there are a few costs really that we should uh, talk about and uh, on top of that l- uh, list is uh, lease expense and you know this this is one thing that hasn't been addressed yet but there should really be a discussion between lessees and lessors you know because uh, even in the bayanihan law it should be a shared burden and and therefore uh, what should be recognized is that it's not only force majeure that's hitting us not only the pandemic that's hitting us there are laws in the land that's hitting us and that law has prevented us in the in the past month to go to the office and that law is limiting our people from going to the office as well you're looking at 50% uh, people going to the office etc so this this shared burden must happen between the lessor and the lessee and i, I still need to uh, uh, have a you know uh, have the chance to see that happen uh, because the Department of Trade, I, I don't think uh, that the DTI has it right. Uh, the DTI is saying, you know, just moratorium and then after the pandemic, you continue paying your lessees and maybe your lease and then maybe pay that in installment. There's not much shared burden in that. And I think there is uh, legitimately a shared burden that could happen in terms of lease. Um, talking about uh, costs that uh, are incurred at home, obviously uh, data costs are incurred at home, forget the mobile cost because it's, it's all data play now uh, and data is king. So for instance, in the firm, uh, we have provided before the COVID uh, for uh, gigabytes of uh, data, I say that 300 uh, pesos per month for all the staff and the managers have uh, so much more benefits in terms of data usage. Uh, you know, but we had a chance to test that during uh, uh, this uh, uh, quarantine period, and uh, I had our GTS people study that. Uh, 300 pesos will get you around uh, 60 hours of audio. 60 hours of audio, Richard. But if you use your video, that only gives you six hours of video a month. So 60 hours of video a month is equivalent to six hours of uh, uh, video a month. Uh, that means uh, you should turn off your cameras in order to maximize your uh, your data usage. I mean, we should turn off our cameras right now, uh, uh, Richard. But there are other uh, small things that uh, helps economize on, on cost. You're not paying for the air conditioning that they incur at home, and that's kind of a tough uh, expense to charge even for tax purposes. Because when you turn on the aircon at home, all the the rest of the family is also using that. What is for business and what is for uh, personal use is the question mark. And if you can charge it for tax, you probably won't be able to charge that for business. There are obvious savings, uh, Richard, like for instance, a firm such as ours, we would pay uh, overtime, not only overtime pay, uh, but also the cost of that overtime, which means food and transportation incurred for overtime. And obviously that is not being incurred uh, Nowadays, and uh, the staff are actually uh, asking us, can we order food uh, at home over time? And, I, and we said, no. <laughs> no, because we, I mean, uh, but we will probably get to that when things normalize and the working at home will be probably more generous uh, in that. No charges to humans and other uh, transportation expenses going to clients uh, because the clients now. Has been more accepting about this uh, working rem- uh, working remote uh, uh, arrangements, and therefore they don't expect you to go to their offices, and therefore we're not being charged uh, for transportation expenses in traveling to and from uh, uh, client uh, offices. Uh, Richard, there are a few uh, other things, Richard, but as I said, working in the office, <laughs> we realize is the luxury, and working from home. Or working remotely is actually the more economical way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Good point. I know there's going to be a, a lot of employers have gone overboard making things more accommodative for their employees. 
like you said, free meals and, and so forth. And then when we turn back to normal, I wonder whether employees are going to still expect those things and we're going to have some problems. We can watch, we can don't make, make, a, can don't I make a everything because we're going to have to take it back. What's yeah, that? Can I make a quick rejoinder, Richard, because I forgot this important uh -huh. thing. Um, th th I received a lot of consultations uh, recently about whether they can retain the flexible work arrangements after COVID in, in the normal times, whether they can retain the flexible work arrangements. And so a lot of employers are actually looking at uh, paying their employees not only based on productive time, but based on results, based on deliverables. Sure. And whether that is valid based on our labor laws. And of course, the, the answer to that is, is yes, the flexible work arrangements are actually allowed under our labor laws. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so even the employers are realizing that a work from home arrangement is actually driving up productivity and allowing them to pay uh, based on results. Okay. All right. Well, these are really good answers. We just got to keep them maybe a little bit shorter, maybe a minute or so. But I know um, Patrick has done a lot of work. Uh, well, obviously, that's his, his only work is HR, you know, digitizing, automating HR functions. Now, HR is a complex field with recruitment, with onboarding, with every mm -hmm. payroll and so forth. But what functions typically <coughs> can be performed in a work from anywhere uh, uh, situation and which cannot? What, what's been your yeah. experience, Patrick? Thanks, Richard, for that, for that question. Because, you know, the reality is almost the entire job can be done remotely with the right tools um and this is a this is a kind of a new thing um because historically to do something like performance management or performance reviews you would really need to meet with every we you know each manager would need to meet with their employees um but these days it can all be done remotely through through surveys through qu online questionnaires um tied into an analytics engine uh, the way that the Sprout enables it. So, you know, the whole job can be done. I would say the exception is there are still uh, legally mandated uh, paper forms. Uh, for example, the employment contract um, is mandated by Dole to be, uh, to be on paper. But even that, you know, you can have a runner bring the documents to your house, you sign them, you send them, you send them back, uh, and it's all taken care of. Uh, I think we should stress that uh, there's no blockers with the right tools. Like, you know, you're not going to be able to, for example, to have a uh, performance uh, review, you have the data from the 360 evaluations, everybody's reviewed each other, um, but you still need to meet with that. The manager still needs to meet with the employee and discuss the results. But And you need a tool for that, like Zoom or Microsoft Teams is a, is a fantastic tool. Um, and we use it quite often for this. Uh, we're we're a huge Microsoft partner, so uh, so yeah, we're very happy to be a partner with Andres and his team. But uh, so yeah, I mean, with the right tools, we digital enablement is is a huge deal these days. Um, and we've taken amazing strides. Uh, the technology industry has taken amazing strides in the last few years. So there's no reason we can't do our HR functions uh, from home. Okay. All right, very good. Okay, our next is uh, David Elmerall. Perhaps I, I, he's done a lot of work digitizing uh, uh, LGU, government operations and agencies. And I know it um, spends a lot of time on this. Also, he has created his organization, the staysafe.ph platform. And if you haven't downloaded that, get online right now. It's just on Google Store. Um, or sorry, a uh, Play Store, and just download it to keep yourself safe. This is what everybody's using. It's it's a seems to be as good, if not better, than what they're using in Korea, Singapore, places like that. So this is the kinds of things that he does. And well, David, what what can people expect from some of these systems? I mean, can you give us some stories of things that will really get people excited? How what what can you tell us, David? Um, first, Richard, um, there are hundreds of IT, uh, excellent IT companies out there, okay? So not, not only Multisys is doing a lot of uh, solutions for this pandemic. But uh, I think uh, what I can tell to people and what can they expect from us uh, is that 
we're here to to contribute our strength, you know. So we're here to contribute something in our own little way, not only to become an enabler, but also to uh, to have a passion to help our fellow Filipinos through the use of technology. So that's one of our biggest passion. Not only me, but my whole team here in Multisys. So uh, as we always mention to my people that hey, one programming code at a time. Every code counts. So one programming code at a time. That's very important. But get excited because uh, Filipino techs and Filipino developed platforms will emerge into world class scale. I believe that that will be like fast and furious in the next couple of years, Richard. Multisys and other Filipino tech companies will be there on top. I will guarantee you that, showcasing the ingenuity of the Filipino brilliant minds. I, I also believe in that because we're empowering a lot of countries mm. now, a lot of good programmers outside the country, you know, the, and trying to, yeah, contributing innovation to different countries. Why not here in the Philippines? Yeah. We should prioritize the country. Really excited also in getting a lot of guidance, you know, constructive criticism, support from different lawmakers, implementers. We we'll learn a lot. To be honest, uh, we need to comply as well. Uh, there are no perfect IT company, Richard, but being guided by them will strengthen the public trust and confidence to use our platforms. Digital transformation is not a one-time, big-time solution, Richard. It's a learning process. It's a learning process. It's a one-step-at-a-time process, and we we'll learn from this mistake. We we'll learn from our implementers, our lawmakers, so we will be guided by them. We aspire to be a tech enabler by developing platforms, by security, and by data privacy by design. That's very important. We need to start, and again, as always mentioned to you in our discussions, we need to start using, believing, and trusting Filipino technology. If we are using foreign web and mobile applications, foreign technologies, and trusting our information to them as long as they are protected, why not a Filipino tech? I think it's time for Filipinos to prove that we Filipinos can trust Filipino tech. And Filipino can do it. And I believe that mm -hmm. Filipino can. That's it, Richard. Thank you. Sure. Very good. I believe so, too. Uh, but certainly, we'll all look forward to the work you're doing so we're not waiting in line to get little permits and, and updating our licenses and, and so forth. So that's uh, exciting. Um, Andres Otola of Microsoft. I know, you know, we have a couple of Microsoft fans here and stuff, but... <laughs> But we're not here to, uh, without sounding like a salesman, Andres, I know you guys have a lot of different applications of which most people only use or, or even know about a small bit of it. But what are some other software that you have that, that helps people, helps organizations work better online? What, what can you tell us? Well, uh, first of all, let me say uh, I was it was great to hear from David, from uh, from Nika, for all of them. And I couldn't agree more with the, with the I, I think the general concept is, we, we we see a lot more than than technology driving this innovation. So think about Commissioner Lewara was talking about security, or communications being optimized for this, or 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 even the the Filipino ingenuity being put up at the at the service of, of of this situation. I think there's there's a lot more. Now to your question on technology, I think definitely uh, data and artificial intelligence and how to mix we make sense of this situation at a micro level. It, it's one of the key. The, the key that uh, will be one of the key drivers moving forward. The second would be perhaps our cloud infrastructure and the ability to be really resilient and have it hey have a complete full you know continuity plan that when you you can have your company up and running despite any problems. Um, perhaps if I have to point out some a single technology, something that's been very successful today is is our Windows virtual desktop technology. Basically, you can run a full desktop from the cloud and service that access that from any sort of device, including a TV set in your home. So in a secure manner, connected to your applications, connected to your inside systems. We've seen a great uptake of that one in particular in the initial phase of people that know when Nico was talking about not being enough PCs and having to ship pieces. We've seen uh, an adoption of that digital PC environment, if you will. Um, so uh, all of those technologies are fully available here in the Philippines. That's the good news, and 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 we can make make use of them right away. Okay, very good. And I gotta say, okay, our our uh, uh, commissioner Laboro, we've had a lot of questions online about his particularly uh, interesting part of things, and now. Commissioner, there's people who say that lawyers and personal privacy advocates are 
saying that tracking people's movement is not allowed under our existing laws. Is there possible legal ground uh, for this to, during the pandemic to be able to work around this? Others are asking um, about what, what about jobs that require confidentiality? How are these work from home? And, and I know we have Alex and Patrick, especially who deal with a lot of confidentiality issues. Maybe they could uh, answer as well, David also. Um, but what would you say to, um, to to this? What are the steps? I'm asking a lot of questions. Sorry, Commissioner, you're you're going to be a, a popular fellow here. But the steps companies can take. I'm sure you you help organizations on this. But um, can you address those rambling questions? How? Uh, what do you think? Oh, I think you need to unmute your. Your, uh, well, thank you, thank you, Richard. Uh, this may be extraordinary times, but uh, uh, sometimes you just need ordinary solutions, no, for for this, uh, for when confronted with the, the challenges, with the present challenges. As to your first uh, question, again, uh, we have always been clear about our posture when it comes to digital solutions and applications. And the National Privacy Commission is for the successful use of digital solutions and technologies and applications during this time. And we do not own, it's not only the National Privacy Commission that, share, that shares that uh, uh, idea, but also the global community too, because we understand the challenges that governments uh, are confronted with in responding to the pandemic. And the effective use of technology, of course, an application may be able to address a, a big part of the responses and challenges that we all confront. But again, the operative word there, there is the successful use. And for it to be successful, any digital solution or uh, application must be trusted and must be inclusive. Because, uh, you know, even if you uh, come up with a technology which you thought would be the uh, uh, could be the, uh, you know very effective in this pandemic, but if people will not trust you uh, in your solution, then they will not you know take up that uh, technology or application, and that will be frustrating not only for government but also for a uh, for a country looking for a solution to the uh, to at least prevent and mitigate or uh, control the spread of the virus. So. Uh, you know, in, uh, when we came up with our bulletins, we made it clear that uh, in this uh, pandemic, there are also certain parameters that we open. And that is, again, making, uh, you know, uh, being transparent, be sure about the legitimate purpose, and only collecting what is the minimum necessary and disclosing it to proper authority or the proportionality of the collection. So even in this time, this general data privacy principles still apply. And it is, again, these uh, principles that are the foundation of trust in, uh, in the new normal and the online environment that we are all in. Now, alongside that, again, uh, I was, uh, well, uh, to your second query about what they can do, for example, in security, you know, again, these are but uh, very ordinary, especially in a work-from-home arrangement. Uh, we have very simple and practical um, tips for everybody. But for, the, for an employer, uh, definitely, again, the simple, uh, the, the first step really is coming up with the right policies. And these policies must cover the portable devices that the employees bring home, the acceptable use whenever they use these devices in their, in their, in their homes. Uh, you know, and the, these policies, again, uh, will uh, not only uh, guide everybody, but uh, make sure, will ensure the accountability of the employees whenever they bring home these devices together with the data inside. You have to track on not only the devices, but the data of uh, these devices have within them. Uh, also, you make sure, that they, again, the very simple practical, all the experts that have spoken before me would uh, be better, they, they could be better experts on this, but you know, making sure that there's multi-factor authentication. I guess uh, even on MSMEs, you know, they would be enabled to this. And don't allow employees to share their devices to prevent breaches. Make sure your employees have secure and stable internet. Um, make sure that the devices that they bring home and uh, the latest antivirus software, latest security patches installed. Uh, remind your employees to activate the privacy settings. 
Uh, when video conferencing, use only the contracted uh, video conferencing platform as a tool by your office. And uh, of course, very important, as mentioned by uh, many of our speakers before, there's really an upswing now of uh, cases of scams and phishing. So remind your employees to think before they click to avoid calling for phishing and other uh, scams. And uh, also, a very simple reminder, we have been getting a lot of pitch reports because of this very simple uh, clicking uh, uh, mistake. Remind your employees to double click, to double check before sending your emails. Be sure that they get all the recipients right uh, when they click CC, uh, you know, send, uh, before they click send, to avoid missent emails, uh, which later could be classified as uh, pitches. And lastly, be prepared for pitch. You have to have, you know, uh, security incident management or policies in place so that whenever these things happen, we can Thank you. Richard. Okay. Okay, Commissioner. Okay, very good. Anything to add on the privacy issue? Because I can tell you the comments really indicate that's going to be a key issue. Yes. Uh, uh, of course, again, uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, the, your, your National Privacy Commission, uh, again, is reminding all those who are uh, all company uh, these are again extraordinary times but we're not throwing data privacy and protection out of the window um, of course first way to, uh, to protect your customers and uh, all those uh, who are asking the questions here is that again the responsibility here is two way for the individuals you must really be um, i mean take time to really look at privacy notices and policies and again, think before you click and before you consent to anything, be sure that you agree with all those, uh, with all the provisions that are in the paper. But uh, that's a very good thing, uh, question that you asked. Really, yes. we will remind yes. all the controllers here, we will remind all the businesses here. The sure. only thing during this time is for you to exercise privacy by design in the architecture of your technology introductions. Okay. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, we have always, uh, you know, privacy regulation has always uh, promoted the uh, uh, personal self-management or privacy self-management. Uh, yes, privacy self-management uh, is here, but at this point, again, uh, really the onus of the accountability and responsibility falls on the shoulders of companies who are introducing, uh, you know, processing personal data. As I mentioned earlier, if you are processing information that can identify an individual, then you are uh, covered under the Data Privacy Act and you must follow the rules and regulations that we have set forth. Sure. Well, how about some of our speakers today? Who, who'd like to go first on, on this issue? Because it's an, an important one. Well, I can tell you, we, we deal with NPC a lot um, and very closely work <clears throat> with them uh, because we, we handle very sensitive, I mean, we're HR and payroll software, so uh, yeah. it's, it's obviously very sensible, sensitive, um, personally identifiable data. Uh, and, you know, I, my advice to companies is NBC is, is a fantastic uh, body because they're, they're very practical and they're very easy to work with and they really go for the simple, like, to the, to the commissioner's point, they really pursue the simple practical solution to these issues. And I think a lot of companies feel uh, maybe uh, intimidated by this body and by the the uh, penalties that come. I mean, there's jail time on the line if you don't you know, follow the guidelines of NPC. Um, and so I think companies feel uh, maybe intimidated but there's no need for that. As soon as you approach NBC, it's, they're very easy to work with. And, and I would push companies to be proactive um, about this rather than reactive. So that, that would be my advice. OK, that's very good advice because that's a very good point. A lot of people do find it intimidating. Um, mm. So, OK, so jump in and, and talk with these guys. Uh, Alex or, or David, do you have anything to add with this? Yes, uh, Richard, may I add something? You know, I, as I said, uh, every time that we develop a platform, as my, as my humble advice to our fellow uh, tech companies, as always mentioned by uh, Commissioner Liboro, and we're being guided by his team, I agreed with Patrick, they're very approachable. Uh, you can ask them what you need, they will guide you, the process and everything. It's very clear, you know, 
NPC is not a blockage, you know. Right. The National Privacy Commission is not a blockage to innovation. It's actually a guidance for us to be more careful, for us to be more accountable, for us to be more transparent to the people. That is done. In fact, we're very grateful to have an, a, an agency like this so, so that both the developer and the user will have understand uh, understanding on the functionality and the usage. You know, I think it's all about the transparency. Once people know that, so the trust and confidence will be built both the user and the uh, developer. So uh, that's what I, I, I think that uh, that can add. Uh, I can add, uh, Richard. Thank you so much. Richard, if I need to add, and then this has probably capped my statements for today. And to all of you listening out there, I have yet to hear of anyone who died or got hurt because they followed data privacy principles. <laughs> and no business has ever gone bankrupt or has failed in their business because they follow data privacy principles. So, you know, that alone, I think, should uh, equip us in our thoughts <laughs> because we move into this new normal. And as the Philippines positions itself in this new normal, everyone is saying our, that our digital strength right now is really the robustness of the tech industry, the BPO industry. We are in the process of processing data. We are in the process, we are in the business of processing data. This country is in the business of processing data. This country is in the business of uh, processing data of other nations, of other uh, citizens of the world. So it's very important that at this point, that again, if you keep, if we keep our interests and our national interests, and I, you know, I go for what uh, Mr. Almirol said, we have to encourage Filipino entrepreneurs during this time. But again, as I mentioned earlier, if we are together and our developers will develop that privacy by design mindset, we can just distinguish ourselves here in the country as a country that develops trustworthy, responsible technologies and that we are as a people uh, stewards of data of uh, the, where they can entrust their data. Yes, very true. And you mentioned a very good point about we too, Filipinos deal with a lot of international clients. And this is very important. Just a couple of scandals around cyber security, and we could lose tens of thousands of jobs, as what happened years ago with, with uh, India. So it's, it's very important. Alex, I know everybody yeah. has this issue. Alex, uh, you want to say yeah. something? Yeah, just, uh, just very quickly, uh, Richard, uh, PwC Philippines, uh, we render uh, data privacy uh, uh, services to help clients uh, com com uh, comply with the Data Privacy uh, Act as well as cybersecurity. But you know, internally in, 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 the, in the firm, our data privacy officer is even more powerful than the uh, chairman. Uh, you know, one time I was uh, telling them, you know, let's, let's uh, give the cell phones of our mobile numbers of our staff to, uh, uh, to, the, to the public, uh, to our clients and the data privacy officer stopped me there and said you, we can't do that without getting the consent of our of our staff uh, but i think the the thing about uh, data privacy is the behavior and uh, it's very important because not everything can be caught documented so you may not be breaching any documentation but in the elevators in outside in public places you may be talking about it or chatting about it online uh, uh mobile phone etc and you may be sharing sensitive information so let's let's not miss the the more human human uh, way of uh, spreading uh, uh, data data about uh, private persons, um, and that should be guarded against uh, as well. So in in the firm, no problems because our behavior has always been uh, to protect the confidentiality of our clients and their information. Okay. Anyone else? Any other last quick uh, responses about that? <laughs> Richard, maybe if I may, Andres here. Um, sure. For us, security and privacy can be hand in hand. When you become a, a global cloud provider, almost every every customer of yours is co-responsible of this. So we've been investing a lot in, in both security and privacy. About a billion dollars a year goes into that research. Um, wow. And we have our, our legal teams are actually right now more engaged than ever before in almost every engagement um, that we do. Our legal team works with us to make sure we get this hand in hand. What I would say to, to our fellow leaders here, we should demand, as much as we build, we should demand this same level of privacy and security uh, support from our vendors out there. I think it's, 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 it's becoming a, a right 
and and a standard and it's something everybody has to have in mind in the new normal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, um, Andres and Richard. Maybe just to um, um sure. to cap off and dovetail from what Andres had mentioned. Um, well, for us, the adage really is there is no security without privacy, and the other way around. Um, security and privacy really work together to make sure that um, things um, operate properly and customer data is uh, safeguarded. Uh, being a telco and being a conglomerate, uh, we've had a lot of um, we have a lot we've had a lot of internal uh, strategic discussions about how we should um, uh, balance customer experience. Um, as well as data privacy. And uh, we've had a lot of work together with the NPC. Uh, it's an ongoing process, but it's a process that has really in mind both the security of our customers um, as well as the experience that we provide to them. Yeah, okay. All right, everyone. So we want a future that is tech-enabled, comfortable and convenient and nice. We can spend more time with our families girlfriends chase maybe even more time to chase a girl or not but i'm just kidding but really really good to have everyone with us we had some really good comments and ideas i know there was so many postings and questions and so forth i wish we could do it all but we can't or i'll get strangled um but thanks everyone we have going from the screen we have alex we have david we have andres we have carlo we have um nico commissioner Laboro and Patrick, really nice to have everyone. Really enjoyed the show. We'll see you again soon. I hope live though next time. All right, guys? <laughs> okay, All right. so that concludes this Asia CEO Forum online. We'll look forward to seeing you again real soon. So watch this and we'll, uh, like I said, we want to see everybody again soon in live. I really miss the personal connection. But this is the best we can do, and it's pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. Mr. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.